Remember how I said I was in deep shit when it came to the life debt I owe the mechanic? I wasn't exaggerating. I've been waiting for it. I didn't know when it was coming or what exactly it was, but I figured it wouldn't be pleasant. The only thing I thought I could rule out was him straight up killing me. If that's what he'd wanted, he wouldn't have bothered getting the white stag out of me. He could have used the possession loophole to simply lob my head off of that damned banjo and take care of two problems at once, but for whatever reason, he didn't. I didn't understand why until the events of this week. Orion got a normal call. Believe it or not, those are more common than the ones I tell you about, but I just figure no one wants to read about insect or rodent infestations when they could be learning more about the neighbors. Would you really want to read paragraphs of me searching for bed bugs in the local Super 8, fogging the place down and having to argue with the owner about how much my services cost because they didn't realize the infestation was that big of a deal? Probably not. And yes, that exact thing did happen two days ago, but I'm not bitter about it. Right off the bat, I noticed that the client was acting anxious. Not too weird. A lot of people get freaked out by cockroaches, and with how much of a mess they're capable of causing, I can't say I blame them. While these critters aren't as dangerous as some of the other things we deal with, they can be carriers of numerous diseases. They're not to be taken lightly, especially for those with pre-existing health conditions. And once they settle in, they can be difficult for a homeowner to remove on their own, despite all the over-the-counter products claiming to do my job just as well as I do. The client's face was beaded with sweat as I started my initial walkthrough. I began with asking him if he'd seen the roaches personally, or if he'd found any waste or moltings anywhere. At first he didn't answer, eyes anxiously flitting around. When I spoke again, he jumped. Sir, are you alright? I asked, genuinely concerned now. Getting freaked out by roaches was one thing, but this was something worse. This man was scared. He swallowed, then stammered, No, I'm... I'm fine. I just... I'm not good around bugs. That didn't seem right. I understand having phobias all too well, but this seemed to be more than that. What if he was cursed like that one guy who was infested with centipedes? He wasn't vomiting. At least not yet. Are you sure? I questioned, trying to sound caring rather than skeptical. He nodded quickly, swallowing again before looking down. I couldn't help him if he wouldn't tell me anything. Something definitely was off. Not sure how to proceed, I decided to drop it for the time being and kept looking for any signs of roaches. In the living room, at least, the place appeared to be clean. I should have trusted my instincts when they told me something was wrong. When I turned, thinking that I saw movement in the kitchen, the client jumped me. I was stronger than him, but he caught me by surprise, waiting until my back was turned. I felt his hands fumbling blindly around my neck as I launched him off of me. As he tumbled to the carpet, I felt the hagstone's chain break off the back of my neck. Everything clicked for me then. This was a trap, and I'd walked right into it like a fucking idiot. The client sobbed on the ground as I made a break for the front door. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had no choice. Even though I knew it was likely too late, I had to get out of there. Blackthorn slithered in to cover the front door, coiling around the doorknob. Shit. Without looking behind me, I reached for the iron poker, only for one of the vines to lash out and snap around my wrist. I had to suppress a gasp as the thorns dug into my skin the sharp pricks accompanied by a hellish cold sucking sensation that made the muscles on my arm twitch involuntarily. Now that I've felt them myself, I genuinely have no idea how Deirdre managed not to scream, and they'd been all over her forearm. I heard Briar's voice over the client's loud crying. You try running again, and they'll go down your throat. Emphasizing his point, the thorns around my wrist tightened until I couldn't feel my fingers. All right! I shouted, trying not to sound as afraid and agonized as I felt. I won't run. I won't fight back. Just tell me what you want. What I want, he replied with a short laugh. You should know it's not about me. The vine's grip around my wrist loosened enough that blood was now allowed to flow freely back into my fingers, the pins and needles sensation only intensifying the thorn's bites. I believed Briar when he threatened to force his vines down my throat. He had not hesitated to do it to that poor construction worker. 
As promised, I didn't fight when he circled around me to meet my eyes, but I did pray. I prayed before the world went dark. Cold water splashed against my face. I scurried away from it, the scratches left by the thorns burning from the movement. For how much they hurt, you'd think they'd be deeper. It just looked like I played with an overly excited cat for a little too long. I whirled around, trying to make sense of my surroundings, finding that I was sitting in a blue bathtub. To my immediate relief, I wasn't tied up, and I still had all four limbs. I was also still human, for the time being. The relief was short-lived. Yola was in the doorway, holding an empty rat fink cup, grinning at me. Rise and shine! My belt was missing. They'd taken my tool belt. Shit! Well, I am sure that ain't the comfiest place to wake up, he said in his typical friendly manner, as if he hadn't just abducted me. But you and your fucking hagstone. Next time, put it under your skin. Give us a real challenge, pup. Wiping away a drop of water to keep it from getting into my eye, I channeled as much bravado as I could when I said, The other two will notice what's happened when I don't come back. You might want to hurry. He clearly saw through it, chuckling as he came in to sit on the side of the tub, far too close for comfort. No, pup. We got all the time in the world. Blue eyes don't even know this place exists. I didn't even know how much time had passed since Briar got a hold of me. They might not have realized that anything had happened to me yet. All right, what's going to happen to me? I asked evenly, avoiding the urge to be obvious about glancing around the room for something to use as a weapon. All I was seeing were teal tiles to match the ugly blue bathtub. Well, I've been thinking. That time in the mines was a real eye-opener for me. So is that fucking deer. You're tough. A lot tougher than I thought you'd be, if I'm being honest. But your life is still going to pass by quickly, isn't it? Especially in your line of work. You really aren't fated to be long for this world, pup. I didn't like where this was going. Not one bit. Unfortunately, at the moment, there was nothing I could do but listen and wait for him to make his point. He continued. Good thing is, your life is mine now. Not quite as good as your soul, but nice consolation prize. As such, I control where it goes from here. Your estimation of 50 years just ain't long enough for my liking. So I'll be giving you something. You've clearly been one for a while. What I've wanted? Iolo gave me a smirk. I'm gonna make you a hero. That was not what I was expecting to hear. Not at all. My bewilderment must have shown on my face. He then added with a derisive glance. Like you said, pup, you're no Kuhala. But you're as close as we're going to get in this modern age. Naturally, that cleared absolutely nothing up. Oh, hold on. You're... What? Flipping the cup around absent-mindedly, he chuckled. Where'd I lose you, puppy dog? I didn't understand this at all. Why? What did he mean? Was he going to prolong my life in some unnatural manner? Would I leave this place with my humanity intact? I had so many questions. But all I could manage to say was, Can we not have this conversation in your bathtub? Apparently, Yola was in the mood to throw me off as much as he could. He offered me a hand up. With a sigh, I grabbed his forearm, letting him pull me up, both of my hips popping painfully after sitting in the bathtub for so long. My lower back ached. I must have been in there longer than I'd thought. And I swear to God, if a single one of you hooligans makes a comment about us holding hands... With his typical smile, he made a comment about how it seemed like I'd finally learned my lesson on accepting help before releasing my arm. Fucker. Mind still racing from countless concerns, I followed him getting a decent look at the rest of the place. It looks like an ordinary hunter's cabin at first, until I started to notice some oddities here and there. One of those oddities was a human skull on the counter, the cranium hollowed out into a bowl to hold loose screws, pens, and keys. Another was a light fixture constructed of ribs and more skulls hanging from wires attached to their eye sockets. Christ. The next thing that caught my eye was the white stag's head, which was stuffed and mounted above the front door. Iolo caught me staring at it, eyes narrowed, daring me to try to reach the door before he could reach me. I thought you were going to put the stag's head in your shop, I asked instead. Don't get me wrong, I did want to run out that door, a frightened impulse rather than one based in reality. Not only was he far too fast for that, but even if I could somehow manage to evade Iolo by some miracle, I had no clue where I was. 
I could be in their world for all I knew. Still eyeing me distrustfully, he grinned. I was, but then it looked so nice right there that I just haven't felt the need to move it. Whoever had stuffed it had done a good job. Too good, in my opinion. It looked like a fat worm could slither out of its mouth at any moment. I made myself look away from it, not wanting to think about how close I'd come to losing myself. Not while there was another worse danger not even ten feet away from me. Of all the questions I had about my situation, I started with one that scared me most. Why are you doing this? Why make me a hero when you could just kill me? Isn't it obvious, pup? Yolo smirked, leaning casually back against the counter. Oh, I, I guess not. Well, I want to use you, puppy dog. Just gotta work on a few things first. While my heart raced at what he was implying, he continued, And I did want you dead for a while. Part of me still does. But that'd be a real waste, wouldn't it? Letting death have you instead? Have me. Use me. Like I was a possession. His possession, specifically. My jaw clenched as I tried to calm myself down, but my mind kept going back to the hunt's crows. The beaks crudely shoved into their mouths, arms broken and reshapen to form wings. As brutalized as they were, they were immortal. Was that what Iolo intended? To make me like them? Or something worse? Growing more and more anxious by the second, I swallowed, then asked, How do you intend to do this? Iolo filled up the rat faint cup with something from a growler he retrieved from the fridge, still acting like this was a casual conversation. Well, there's a few ways to go about it, but we'll get to that. I swallowed again, trying not to make it obvious that I was looking at the door out of the corner of my eye. I wanted to run more than anything. Despite the life debt, despite not knowing if I was somewhere in the mounds, despite knowing that trying to run from a hunter was useless. Yolo caught me considering escaping again. He looked devious as he held another glass of that mystery liquid towards me. Care for a drink? He had that wicked look in his eyes. I think he wanted me to say no, to reject his hospitality. I don't know why. He already had my life. Under neighbor terms, he already had just cause to make me into yet another macabre furniture piece. Remember what I told Yins about neighbors and food? Don't eat or drink anything that they offer you, but be clever about it? I just had to accept the glass. I didn't have to drink whatever was in it. I silently reached for it, jaw tight with nerves as I watched it swirl around the cup. It smelled sweet, the liquid opaque. Mead, maybe? He nodded at the cup in my hand. See, puppy dog, I could force that down your throat right now. You wouldn't be part of the human world anymore. I could rearrange you like I do them crows. Take away that mouth of yours so that I never have to hear that bullshit ever again. But you know why I'm going to wait on that? When I didn't say anything, gazing at the meat in my hand, feeling my heart thud harder and faster, he answered. It's like I told you a while back. I'll have a bit of respect for you. Enough that I'd be willing to let you keep that precious free will of yours as long as I can count on you not to fuck with me. What would I have to do to convince you to let me retain my humanity? I dared to ask. He sighed, tilting his head back. He was loving this. He must have missed having control. Well, pup, I think I'd miss having the opportunity to see you get all worked up around me if I completely gutted out everything that makes you you. So... It's not going to take much convincing. Just keep in mind that it's an option. If you ever try warming your way out of this. That probably should have been a relief. The problem was that everything was still too far in his favor. If he decided I wasn't doing what he wanted, he could easily change his mind. Although, maybe it wasn't entirely in his favor. If I became what he wanted and was able to retain enough of myself afterwards, I may finally have the power to stop him once and for all. No more of having to look over my shoulder for him, and those under his control. It would finally be over. I'd finally be free. That little spark of hope gave me the confidence to ask, What do I need to do? Now that's what I like to hear, he said with a smile. He nodded towards something behind me. I figure with the way you swing that stupid fire poke around, that should be a somewhat natural place to start. On the couch that had clearly been patched over and over again, I never would have imagined that he'd know how to sew in a million years, was a sword sheathed in worn black leather. Upon closer inspection, the hilt was small, roughly the same width as the blade. The handle appeared to be made of an antler. Hold on. I glanced back at the white stag's head. Yes, some of its distinctive jagged antler had been removed. 
A curved iron plate on the scabbard's mouth matched the one on the guard, reminding me of a crescent moon. When I removed the sword from its sheath, I found that it had a leaf-shaped, double-edged blade that was roughly a foot and a half in length. Definitely something for slashing rather than thrusting. It ain't Excalibur, but it'll do, Yolo explained as I examined it. It's pure iron, so only use it on the shit I tell you to, understood? It ain't as strong as steel. It's new, but made with an old process that you probably don't care to hear, and I care even less to describe. Someday, I will use this to destroy you, Yolo up Hugh. His laugh made me flinch. <laughs> you were thinking of killing me just then, weren't you, pup? Throat tight, I opened my mouth to disagree, but then let the words die on my tongue. He'd know if I lied. I was so tired and distressed that I was letting my face give me away. Surprisingly, Iolo didn't seem angry. Worse, he actually seemed to find it funny. Go on and try it, puppy dog. It is iron after all. Should do the job just fine. And I sent Briar off a while ago. We're all alone here. Nothing's stopping you. We both knew I couldn't beat him in a fight, especially with only a sword that I didn't know how to wield to protect me. At least if I'd still had some salt in my hagstone, I wouldn't have been completely fucked. I know better, I told him, setting the weapon down. I want to see just how much work I've been cut out for me. So go on, do it. Do it and really mean it, pup. He challenged, sounding far too excited. I tell you what, if you can land a hit on me, just one. It don't even have to be a good one. I'll forget all about your life debt. I already knew how this was going to go. We both did. Dangling freedom above my head once again just to get what he wanted. He was just being an asshole for fun. What else was new? Entirely unenthused, I let out a heavy sigh and held the sword in the same way I did the fire poker, out in front of me with the tip pointing towards him. He snickered when he saw my expression. <laughs> I would have thought you'd been Jones for a chance to beat my ass. I'm over it, I snapped. I'm over it and I'm over you. Yolo stood up a bit straighter as I approached him, opening a drawer next to him to pull out a butter knife. He held it up to me with that shit-eating grin. Looks like you better win, then. Of course he had to be even more of an asshole about it and use a damned butter knife. Of course. I swung the sword at him. He didn't bother trying to get out of the way, stopping the blade by simply raising the butter knife. I withdrew, then got the idea to pretend like I was going one way only to change direction at the last second. Once again, he was able to stop me with just the dull knife. Well, right off the bat, you're clumsy, he commented, stepping aside so that my next slash completely passed by him. I could see what you were going to do long before you actually did it. What do you want from me, prick? I stepped back hoping that maybe if I could regain some space between us, I could find an opening. The sword gave me longer reach, but in a tight space like a kitchen, that was more of a hindrance than an advantage. Yolo's eyes narrowed, scanning my movements thoughtfully. It appeared that he'd gone from treating this like a joke to actually analyzing me. I had to think. We were in close quarters. I didn't properly know how to use the weapon I was holding. If I could just find where he'd put my tool belt, I could use salt to make it harder for him to move around as well, possibly even trap him. But would I have time? And what if the tool belt wasn't even at the cabin? He could have had Briar dispose of it. At the very least, if I couldn't find the tool belt, maybe I could find a room where I had a bit more movement. Or at the very least, force him through a single entryway. There was no way he'd let me out that front door. I'd have to find somewhere in the cabin. The bathroom was the only other room I'd seen so far. There had been two more doors in that short hallway we'd come through to get to the living room and the kitchen. Not daring to turn my back to him, I retreated down the hallway, taking a chance on the first door I came across. A bedroom. I'd half expected to find some poor soul chained up and in some gruesome state, but thankfully there was just a bed and a dresser. And most importantly, a single point of entry. It occurred to me then that only his living room had windows. Maybe we really were in the mounds. The room was still small, far too small to be able to do me any good, but I had already accepted I was losing this fight. Didn't mean I had to make it easy for him, though. I considered hiding by the door to try to get him as he came through, but I had a feeling he'd expect that. I decided then that I was going to charge him head on. It was stupid, and something I'd never try if I thought I had even a chance to overtake him, but it was something he most likely wouldn't see coming. 
The sword wasn't made for stabbing, so maybe a vertical slash would do something. Probably not, but better than doing nothing. That was exactly what I did when Yolo eventually appeared in the doorway. Without making a sound, I ran at him, putting as much power as I could behind the swing, aiming for the top of his head. The sword never found its mark. Even with throwing everything I'd had left at him, I'd still been too slow. The sword clattered to the wooden floor, the smell of black cherries overwhelming as I ended up with Iolo's forearm pressed against my throat, the butter knife close enough to my left eye that my eyelashes brushed against it. I couldn't look away from that dull edge, waiting for it to plunge in as Iolo calmly graded my attempt. Well, you have good ideas, just don't quite have the strength or control to execute them. And you figure out pretty quick that that thing ain't much for stabbing, so you're not completely hopeless. Might be able to make a hear out of you yet. Without warning, he then let me drop to the ground, landing painfully on my side with a grunt. Yolo examined the sword, most likely making sure it hadn't gotten damaged in this little test. Meanwhile, I picked myself up, wondering if it'd be worth it to risk kicking him. No, it wouldn't be. I'd have my chance to retaliate. So now what? I asked. You're going to teach me how to use a sword? Yeah, pup, that's exactly what's going to happen. He replied, seemingly satisfied that the sword was still in good shape. And in the meantime, you leave your hacks on at home when I come around. You know now that we have the ways of getting rid of them. I don't give a shit if you use them on anyone else, but I ain't tolerating it anymore. And that's work for you? That last sentence was tacked on so nonchalantly that it didn't register that he'd even said it for a second. I blinked and shook my head, completely short-circuiting. Yeah, knights. Like I have a choice. Now, unfortunately for you, Yolo continued, I don't want you being able to come back here anytime you want, so I'm gonna have to knock you out again. Hope you don't mind. Hold on! I held up a hand between us, taking a step back. Where are we meeting? And when does this all start? And how exactly do you plan to knock me out? He said he'd expected to see me at the clearing with the skull tree starting the next day. I should have expected that. As far as anesthetizing me went, he announced that he had ketamine. Fucking ketamine! Why did he have ketamine? You are not using ketamine on me, I said sternly. He raised his eyebrows. Well, Briar's off towing someone, so he ain't an option at the moment. Only other alternative is I choke you until you pass out. And to keep you out long enough to get you back where you need to be, I have to do it for a long time, which means brain damage. So yeah, you're gonna want the ketamine. Jesus fucking Christ. Can you just blindfold me? I protested. I assure you, I have no desire to return here. Yolo, clearly losing patience, sighed. I'm not taking that chance, not with you. Like it or not, you're going to fuck under, pup. Now, do you want to do it the nice way or the mean way? Even though I was horrified, I gave up. Fine, nice way. Yolo brought me back out to sit on the couch while he got it ready. The idea of letting him drug me was making me sick. I tried to assure myself that once I got knocked out, the day would be over. I wouldn't be in this cabin anymore. I could call Victor and let him know about all of this. It didn't take long. Just a pinch on my arm and the void swallowed me. Before the dizziness took over completely, I grimly wondered how many other people he'd done this to. So, here's my review of ketamine. Bad. Really bad. This was exactly why I've never experimented with anything other than alcohol, and even then that's a rare occasion. I hate feeling like I'm not in control of myself. I was wandering through the woods, and happened upon Grandma dancing with nobody in her pretty white wedding dress. She smiled as she spun in a waltz, twirling around and around until she turned to dust. The dress fell to the grass with a heavy thud. The whispering thing with its insect-like triangular head and huge eyes was trying to speak, but as per usual, I didn't understand it. Its folded appendages grasped at the dress, tearing the fabric, low hums making my chest shake. Behind me, a woman screamed in rage as her footsteps approached quickly. Before she reached us, I came to in the back seat of my jeep. I was confused. My arms felt weird, floaty, like they weren't mine. Hold on. Why was I in the jeep? Wait. YOLO. He most likely couldn't get into my apartment with the salt, so he must have considered this the next best thing. To his credit, the doors were locked, and the windows were down enough to keep the inside at a comfortable temperature. He'd even parked me by the Weeper's River. 
The first thing I did was call Victor. The phone felt too heavy in my hand. I was so out of it that I couldn't tell if I was talking too slowly or him too quickly. What I could gather was that my co-workers had been looking for me when I didn't return from that cockroach call. When they couldn't find me, they searched for the client to try to figure out what happened, but he'd also gone missing. When I told Vic I'd been dosed, he told me to stay where I was. No problem. My arms were strange enough to deal with, legs seemed impossible. With the state I was in, it took forever for me to notice that the sword was sitting on the passenger seat in its scabbard, buckled in. Centuries passed by in milliseconds. In that time, the ketamine convinced me that I was a murderer, just like my sperm donor, just like YOLO. I accepted this. By the time Vic got to me, a lot had been dug up within me that should have stayed buried. The boss babysat me while the stupid ketamine worked through my system. Through that time, I had several more harrowing epiphanies that I forgot. Eventually, thankfully, my body and I were reunited again. Once I was coherent enough to converse, Victor asked me how I was feeling. Like I want to cut Iolo's head off, I said flatly. Victor snorted, sounding as tired as I was. Please do. After he convinced me to nibble at a frozen pizza and drink some water, he then admitted, When you called, I didn't think you were going to be you anymore. With a deep sigh, I muttered, Yeah, I was afraid of that too. We both eyed the sword as if it were somehow responsible for this situation. It had been placed on my dining room table like a centerpiece. Dumbly, it occurred to me that some LARPers would probably lose their minds at a chance to get their hands on a fey-made iron sword. You can do it, you know, Victor said. Become a hero. I'm going to try my best. Who knows? Maybe I'll avenge us someday. Maybe. I wish I could end this update on a positive note. Just know that I have hope. Something you need to know is that Orion will have to do some mutual aid for another specialty pest control provider in the next week. We'll be working with Victor's old employer, the River King's Pest Specialties, located near Cuyahoga Falls in Ohio. I can't give any details at the moment, just know that it's... a situation. I'll fill you in when I can. We're making the journey out tomorrow. And I'll have to make it back before my evil fairy godfather decides to turn me into a pumpkin. While these critters aren't as dangerous as some of the other things we deal with, they can be critter- Now that I've felt them, I genuinely have no idea how The vine's grip around my wrist loosened enough that blood was now allowed to flow freely Meh. Iolo stood up a bit straight. Train! The room was still small. Far too small to be able- Hmm? That last sentence was tacked on so nonchalantly that it didn't even- Hmm. As far as aneth aneth anesthetizing. We'll be working with Victor's old employer, the River King's Pest Specialties, located- We'll be working with Victor's old employ- We'll be working with Victor's old employer, the River King's spe- ha <laughs> ha Today's episode included the amazing voice talents of Moxie, Hulking Enigma, and Eric Thatcher. You can find their links in the description down below. Make sure to give them some love. Thanks for watching! Stay creepy, everybody!